Hello and welcome to my video on one-to-one -one functions and inverse functions. This will conclude chapter one um, and so we'll have a test coming up shortly. Um, but what we want to look at today is one-to-one uh, -one functions, what that means, and finding how to find an inverse function. So our objectives today are first to determine if a function is one-to-one -one, uh, algebraically and graphically. So we're going to look at characteristics of both. Number two, verify two functions are inverses of each other. Number three, graph the inverse of a function when given a function's graph. Number four, find the inverse of a function. Number five, visualize the relationship between the domain and range of a function and its inverse. And number six, understand why functions and their inverses are symmetric about y equals x. Let's start out with a definition, and this is a definition of what it means to be one-to-one. -one. A function is said to be one-to-one -one if no two elements in the domain correspond to the same element of the range. Let me say that again. A function is one-to-one -one if no two elements in the domain correspond to the same element of the range. In other words, if I have two x values, let's call them x1 and x2, and I know they're not equal, then f of x1 cannot be equal to f of x2. One of the ways that we have to determine if a function is one-to-one -one is the horizontal line test. Now, it's important to remember here that we are talking about functions first. So everything we talk about when we deal with the horizontal line test must first have already passed the vertical line test, which says it's a function. So what the horizontal line set, test says is that if every horizontal line intersects the graph of a function in at most one point, then the function is said to be one-to-one. -one. Let's look at a couple examples here. Uh, first of all, let's look at example one. In this case, in example one, we can go through and draw a horizontal line, and we can see that if I draw that one in, it does intersect the graph in more than one spot. So graph number one is not one-to-one. -one. Graph number two, you look at that graph and you can see, yes, clearly that this thing, uh, that a horizontal line is only going to hit this graph in one spot at any given point. So in graph number two, that graph is one-to-one. -one. Graph number three is also one-to-one. -one. Now notice that it does not continue on like the other ones had domains of the real numbers. This one does not. It has Its domain is not all real numbers, but it is still a one-to-one -one function. And number four would not be one-to-one. -one. Okay, so well, one of the things I want you to do is look at these graphs uh, make and see if you can come up with a char some characteristics of functions that are one-to-one -one versus functions that are not one-to-one. -one. The big thing I wanted you to notice with the graphs, one-to-one -one functions are either always increasing or always decreasing. They, are, they will never change direction. If you take a look at the functions, the graphs in the, in the last uh, part that were not one-to-one, -one, number one and number four, they had changes in direction. They had, they had relative minimums. They had relative maximums. Okay, The graphs that, um, like number two, that one did not have a relative minimum or, or maximum. Graph number uh, three did have a relative minimum, but it was always increasing. So it just, it, it was not one-to-one. -one. These ones, will, they'll never change direction and they will never be constant. In order to be one-to-one, -one, they must always be either increasing or decreasing. Now, given that graphs, though, are generally approximations of the curve, they, we, we get them from their calculator, uh, we approximate those graphs, uh, they are not necessarily the, the best way to determine if a function is one-to-one -one or not. What we need is a test, and that, yes, that does mean a proof that a function is one-to-one. -one. Now, this is going to be a different type of proof than what you're probably thinking of. You're not going to be doing the two-column proof. I'm not going to ask you to do a statement, reason, table, proof like you did in high school geometry. 
Okay, what we're going to do is it's another type of proof. It's, it's, it's a very common proof. I had to do this a number of times in my college, in my classes when I was in college. We had to prove a function is one to one. So what happens in this case is that you're going to be given a function f of x. Now we're going to go through and we're going to have two random variables, x1 and x2. They're going to be real numbers. And they're going to be real numbers that such that when I put it into function f, I know that x1 is equal to x2. And what I'm now going to do after that is I will solve that resulting equation for x1. So in other words, I'm going to get x1 by itself. And if, when I finish up, if I get that x1 is equal to x2, then that tells me that f is 1 to 1. Because that, what that would mean is that if I put two numbers into function f, if I get the same thing, the numbers that I put in had to be the same number. Let's look at a couple examples. The first example is going to be f of x, which is equal to x cubed plus 2. So what you had to remember from that uh, last, what we just saw, was that the first thing I have to do is I'm going to have two numbers, x1 and x2, such that f of x1 equals f of x2. So in other words, f of x1 I know is going to be x1 cubed plus 2, and that's going to equal f of x2, which is going to be x2 cubed plus 2. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for x1. In other words, I'm going to go and get x1 by itself. So the first thing I'm going to need to do on that is I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides so I can get rid of the, the plus 2. So minus 2, minus 2. And when I do that, I get x1 cubed equals x2 cubed. Solving for x1, I'm going to now take the cube root of both sides. So I take the cube root of x1 cubed, and that equals the cube root of x2 cubed. And the cube root and the cube undo each other, so the result is that I get x1 equals x2. And so because x1 is equal to x2, I can say that, that, therefore, f of x is 1 to 1. That is the extent of our proof. Okay, that's what you're going to be asked to do. If you're going to be asked to algebraically show me that a function is 1 to 1, that's what I'm going to expect to see, that you go through, you let f of x1 equal f of x2, like we did here and here, and you're going to solve that thing. You're going to solve for x1, and you'll get x1 equals x2. Now, some of you might be sitting there saying, well, wait a second. How is that any different from any other problem? Wouldn't this always work out like this? Well, not necessarily. Let's take a look at our next example. In this example, we have function g, g of x, which is equal to x squared plus 3. So again, like we did last time, if it's, we're going to check this, we're going to check to determine if this is 1 to 1. So I'm going to let g of x1 equal g of x2. So when I do that, I will get x1 squared plus 3 equals g of x2, which will be x2 squared plus 3. Now what I need to do is go and solve this for... Um, x1. So again, I want to get the x1 by itself. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 3. And when I do that, I now have that x1 squared equals x2 squared. Now, it looks like at this next spot, we know we have to take the square root, but this is where you have to be careful. Because we know that when we take the square root, we must include the plus or minus. So when I take the square root of this, I can say that the square root of x1 squared is, is equal to plus or minus the square root of x2 squared. And therefore, I can say x1 
equals either positive or negative x2. So in this case, I have, I've gone and shown that even though I know that g of x1 is equal to g of x2, I can't really say that x1 is the same thing as x2. It could be the opposite. So in this case, I would say, therefore, g of x is not 1 to 1. Now we get to another definition. The definition in this case is for what it means to be an inverse function. So in this situation, we have two functions, f and g, and they are going to be one-to-one -one functions such that when I do a composition of function g into function f, that f of g of x is equal to x for every x in the domain of g, and, got to remember both of these, g of f of x equals x for every x in the domain of f. If that's true, then g is the inverse of the function f, and g is denoted by this, this f to the negative 1 power, and that is read f inverse. So take a moment right now, pause the video, and copy down this definition. Now, one of the things that's important to remember in these problems, inverse functions undo each other. It's like taking a function, if a lot of times they think of, of a function as a machine, it's like throwing that machine into reverse. Okay, whatever one thing, one function did, its inverse will totally undo. And so that is why when you go through and you do a composition of a function with its inverse that you will get X. It will just, you'll put in f of g of x results as x. Everything that g did to x is going to be undone by f, and therefore the result will be x. The same is true in the other one as well. Let's look at some facts about inverse functions, okay? First of all, since these in functions and their inverses do undo each other, okay, one of the things to keep in mind is the domain of f is going to be the range of f inverse. That will always be the case. The range of f is going to be the domain of f inverse. In other words, the domain and range will switch spots. And that makes sense if you realize that one function undoes the other. Okay. The next thing you have to keep in mind is the if, if I look at the graph of a function and its inverse, the graph of the inverse is going to be a reflection about, the, about y equals x of the function f of x. So if I go through and if I graphed a function, I graphed its inverse, and I graphed the line y equals x, if I could fold along that y equals x, the two graphs would land on top of each other. What this also means for us is, as we've done before with the transformations, I'm going to ask you to tell me, what do you know about, if I tell you this point is on the graph of a function, what does that mean in terms of the inverse? What's, what point is there? And what I know on this is that if a point AB is on f of x, because the domain and range switch, that also means the x's and y's switch, then I know the point B comma A is on f inverse. In other words, if I know that f of 2 is equal to 7, in other words, that on the, on the graph of f, the graph of f contains the point 2 comma 7, then I know that f inverse of 7 is equal to 2. In other words, the point 7 comma 2 is on the inverse of function f. So now what we have to do is we have to identify how do we go about finding a function's inverse, okay? Well, first of all, we have to let uh, f be 1 to 1. It has to already be 1 to 1, um, and we're going to talk in class about different ways to go through and, and deal with the whole 1 to 1 restriction. Um, and then you can use either one of these two procedures, one in green, one in red. I will tell you, I usually use the one in red, 
that's the way I've always worked with it. But some people I know have used have done the one in green. It's just really the difference is when do you interchange X and Y? Do you interchange X and Y early in the process or do you wait till the end? I tend to switch it early in the process. But in terms of the green, what you're going to do is you're going to have a function and you're going to let y equal f of x. And then once you have y equals f of x, you're going to take that equation and you're going to go and solve it for x. In other words, you're going to get x on it by itself on one side of the equal sign and everything else on the other side. And what I'm going to then do is I'm going to replace f, f um, I'm going to replace x, sorry, with f inverse of y. And once I have that, so I'm going to have f inverse of y equals everything that was without an x. And then the next thing I'll do and the last thing I do is then I just switch the x and y's. Replace all the y's with x. That's what I'm going to end up doing, and that will end up solve, giving me the inverse of f of x. What I usually do, and the other way, and I think uh, uh, I can't, I don't know which method uh, the Algebra 2 teachers use, but the one I usually use is, again, in red, is I first let y equals f of x, just like we did in the previous one, but the very first thing I do is switch x and y. So I'll already have that switched, and then I solve for y, and then I'm going to let y equal f inverse of x. It's also important to remember that when I make that switch of x and y, again, realize that the domain of f has now become the range of f inverse, and the range of f is now the domain of f inverse because I've switched the x's and y's. Let's take a look at an example. I want to find f inverse of x for f of x equal to 1 over x minus 1. So what I have is y equals 1 over x minus 1. I've replaced f of x with y equals. Now I'm going to go through and switch x and y. So when I do that, I will have x equals 1 over y minus 1. And then the next thing I have to do is I need to now solve it for y. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to think of this as x over 1, and I'm going to cross multiply. So I'm going to get x times y minus 1 equals 1 times 1, which is just going to be 1. And now I want to get y by itself. The first thing I do is I'm going to divide everything by x. So I divide by x. So the x's now drop off, and I have y minus 1 equals 1 over x. I add 1 to both sides. 1 over x plus 1. Now again, I want to think of that as a fraction, get a common denominator of x, so I'll have to multiply uh, the second one by top and bottom by x. And when I do that, I'm going to get y equals 1 over x plus x over x, which will be 1 plus x over x. And so therefore, I have right now, therefore I can say f is inverse of x is equal to 1 plus x over x. Okay, now that we've gone through and seen how to go and find the inverse of a function, I'm giving you two functions that are 1 to 1. Um, g of x, which is 8x cubed, and h of x, which is negative 2 thirds x plus 4. These are one-to-one -one functions. Uh, you can go and test it out. I would try that proof technique on each one, um, but they should work out. And what I would like you to do is go through and find the inverse of these two functions and then graph them on your calculator. Graph, uh, let y1 be the original function, y2 be its inverse, and y3, let that just be y equals x. And what I would like you to also do when you graph it, uh, graph it, excuse me, graph it on using zoom 5. So when you press your graph, do zoom 5. Zoom 5 is zoom square. It sets the window to look more like uh, keep, keep all proportions in their proper uh, location, in a proper amount. So uh, with that, uh, what, you need, what you need to do is do those graphs and uh, then 
go through, take a look at the do the whisk, and we will see you next class. Thank you, and have a good day or evening, whichever the case may be.